Uh, so welcome everyone. Joanne and I are excited to be speaking to you today about OER. Uh, for those who may be new to this term, uh, OER stands for Open Educational Resources. We will be using the shortened OER for the rest of the presentation. We have lots of different experience levels with OER in the room today from what you've shared in chat. Uh, so for those that have used OER in the past, uh, feel free to share your experiences in the chat alongside us. Uh, Hands-on experience and advice is incredibly valuable, especially for those who are just starting to explore and are curious to know more. So we have uh, Brock's official land acknowledgement on the screen, but Joanne and I wanted to share our own personal acknowledgements as well. Uh, a way I personalize my land acknowledgement is to tie it to my own experience with the land. I'm originally from Edmonton, Alberta, which is uh, Treaty 6 territory specifically. And as I've moved to the Niagara region, I've responded to that move by learning about the peoples and treaties of my new home. Uh, I'm grateful that I've had the ability to move freely between treaty territories, and it's up to me to know my responsibilities towards the land and its people because we are all treaty people. I hope that as we move through this presentation, we consider ways that our work impacts Indigenous communities and can be used to support and advocate alongside them. And I'm speaking to you from Bracebridge in Muskoka, about two and a half or so hours north of Toronto. Um, many people know Muskoka as a tourist place, but it's important to remember that it is the uh, traditional lands of the Anishinaabe people. And the, that Indigenous community has did play and continues to play a significant role in just the, even the day-to-day -day life of this area, uh, particularly as we encounter such pressure, development pressure, uh, to acknowledge that there was a reason why it was originally such an attractive place, the natural environment. So in this acknowledgement, I would like to express my respect and gratitude for the efforts to maintain the natural beauty and the uh, uh, community uh, uh, here. Thank you. Uh, so we're glad to meet you and we'll do it. Brief introductions as well. My name is Kimberly Ash. I'm the teaching and learning life. I'm a teaching and learning librarian here at Brock. Uh, open education and OER have a strong connection to librarianship. Our profession wants people to have access to the information that they need. And so uh, that strong connection has led me to wanting to be more involved in using my professional expertise uh, to support others in their exploration of OER and in open education more broadly. I'm an instructor in the adult ed department in the faculty of education. All the courses that I teach are online and I noticed someone in the chat also mentioned that their courses were completely online. That means that our learners are very diverse. They could be anywhere. Um, we don't always get to know them right away. And so even as we begin designing our courses, we need to be highly conscious of the diversity that these students bring and ensure representation and inclusion of them. I became interested in open education generally and particularly resources about two years ago when I was asked to redevelop two courses and to not use expensive print textbooks. And that sent me into a complete spin. I didn't know where to look for alternatives. I didn't know how to search efficiently. I didn't know how I could use them, what kind of permissions were available to me. And so I was leaning very heavily on the Brock librarians for support and, and practical help. That experience really uh, reinforced for me that uh, for I hope, and I think for sure, open education is the way of the future. And that if I were going to be an effective online educator, I would have to learn more and become more effective in using open education resources. So when I had the opportunity to uh, apply to be a ranger, I jumped on the chance the last summer and um, here I am. <laughs> 
The Rangers program is an, is an initiative of eCampus Ontario, and this slide gives a little description of what eCampus is. Uh, the Rangers program is across the province, and uh, ideally there is at least one every year, one Ranger in uh, every uh, education higher ed institution across Ontario. And this year, there are two. Uh, Kim and I are the Brock Rangers this year. There will be, or there have been others before us. The Rangers mission is to uh, encourage people to learn more and possibly uh, adopt or um, use components of OERs in their program. So we're hoping that this presentation will achieve that goal. Our presentation is uh, constructed around a no do be framework. We're hoping that by the end of this uh, presentation, you will know uh, the key components of open education resources, OERs, particularly the five R's, and the kinds of supports that are available to you now at Brock to help you get started on your journey. We also hope that the presentation will develop some know-how, the skills that you need to locate and evaluate the resources that you might find, and uh, perhaps how to share and how to use them in your course or your program. Finally, we hope that the presentation will uh, stimulate your curiosity, and encourage you to explore, and maybe build a little confidence if you think, uh, well, I'll leave my story, but if I can do it, you can do it, um, in that sense of becoming an open education educator. So we wanted to start out by hearing from you what the term open means to you and how does that connect to your teaching? So uh, share in the chat with us and we'll give you a minute or two to, to think and respond. Shy. <laughs> Good. Easily accessible. Mm -hmm. Available. Yeah. I like that, that inclusive, different learning. we've got a different framing here to be open to different perspectives. Mm -hmm. That kind of goes with that inclusive idea of um, it's big and personal at the same time or can be. Yes, nice. Oh, nice. Agency. Reduce barriers. Good. Mm -hmm. All right, thanks. Thanks everyone for, for sharing your perspectives on what open means to you. Uh, so keeping with uh, those thoughts about uh, open in mind, let's start out more broadly with the concept of open education. 
Uh, the open education movement seeks to make education more accessible, like you've mentioned, and inclusive and affordable, but also thinking more about collaborative, creative, and sustainable as well. Uh, and this can be done by removing barriers and broadening access to education and educational content. So we're opening it, it up not only to those within our course or within our institution, but beyond as well. Uh, using and creating OER is one way of participating in uh, open education efforts. Um, OER is what we will be focusing on specifically for this workshop. So open education is the broader movement and OER is one part of that. So thinking back to our personal definitions of open, and a lot of you were repeating what we had on prepared on the slide, so it's really great to see. Uh, thinking So thinking back to those definitions, uh, here is a formal definition of openness uh, from David Wiley, who is a, a prominent voice in open education. So he's talking about the terms open content and open educational resources and how they describe any copyrightable material that is either in the public domain or licensed in a way that provides everyone with free and perpetual permission to engage in what are called the five R activities. So those are retain, revise, remix, reuse, and redistribute. And these five activities are a key component of OER and it's what really makes them open. So diving a bit deeper into the five R's, they are meant to um, to describe certain uses and activities. For example, permitting redistribution means that you are welcome to share the material with others. Um, and these are the core of the beliefs of open education and OER. The goal is to provide flexibility so that we can use, reuse, share, make changes to, and even keep materials. But it's also about reciprocity too, permitting others to do the same with the materials that we make so that we're growing an open education community. Uh, so Joanne and I were curious, are you already using materials that may permit this kind of use? And if you have an example, please, please share that in chat. Excuse me, one sec. I think while people are typing and thinking, we'll, mm -hmm. we'll keep going. Uh, so, so keep typing in chat. Don't, don't stop sharing your ideas. I've been referring to OER generally, but uh, what do those look like? What am I referring to exactly? Um, and they can be pretty much anything. Uh, most people probably think of OERs as textbook-like materials, but they can be test banks, lesson plans, or podcasts and videos and any number of things. As long as they align with the five R's, they can technically be open or they can be OER. Ooh, boss has an example here. Mm -hmm. X class based resources from another college professor. Ah, so sharing amongst each other. 
so now I do need to mention that there is a distinction between materials that are free for you to access versus truly open materials. And I wanted to take some time to differentiate between those two now. So free materials may not cost you anything to access, like a newspaper article or an academic article through the library, but they don't necessarily allow for the five R's. For example, we know that we can share a chapter of a library book with our students, but we can't make changes to that chapter or turn it into another format like a video or redistribute widely to a bunch of people outside of the class. That's because that chapter and the book it came out of are protected under copyright. Open materials, on the other hand, have indicated that you are able to modify and share widely. Typically, they include a license like the one on the screen, that like gray box there. Uh, and those are used to indicate what you are permitted to do with that material. So I'll go into more detail about these licenses a little bit later on. Uh, the benefits to students of OERs are are tremendous and variable. Uh, cost reduction is the big one, and that that is important. But there are many others, and many of them you've already sort of touched on in your chat when you talked about uh, what open meant to you, the idea of being accessible and inclusive, uh, the possibility of customization to suit particular learning needs or perhaps to suit a particular purpose in an assignment or in the course itself. Uh, accessibility is huge. Now, if I move to the... Uh, Benefits for instructors, we find that many of the same benefits for students also apply to instructors. The adaptability and flexibility to meet your students and to also accomplish certain um, goals in your program. I can get really excited about the possibility of co-construction and creativity and, and the kind of remixing and redistribution elements of OERs that uh, open up possibilities that are well beyond what's possible in a print textbook. And I've been sort of exploring a little bit on the side about AI and again, a, a ton of uh, to learn there. But as instructors, we need to address how we're going to accomplish uh, reliable and valid assessments with um, chat GPT and everything else floating around. And it seems to me that uh, if we kind of shift our attention more to the process as opposed to a product and uh, open education resources seem to uh, offer opportunity for a lot more process oriented instruction and assessment. So that's exciting to me. So now that we have a, a better understanding of what OER are and what their benefits can be to both you and your students, let's talk about how you can find some. So there's a few things to keep in mind while you're searching, and uh, those recommendations are to keep your focus narrow to start. Uh, maybe think of a weekly topic in your course or try to find an alternative for like a specific reading you're using. And uh, secondly, think beyond just text readings. Since OER can be any number of things, maybe there's a video that would work really well, or maybe there's a test bank that uh, you can make use of. I'm going to jump in here just right <laughs> to reinforce Kim's point, because you're going to hear my story. And uh, this advice I really needed. When I began my search, I used too big a word, curriculum, and then I used too small a word, Malcolm Knowles, a guru of adult education. And it was a challenge to find that sweet spot in the middle that really uh, took me to the resources that I was hoping to find. Uh, the other thing I didn't do effectively, but I've learned a little bit more how to, is to apply filters so that you can choose are you, am I looking for a video or a text or just what exactly? And maybe you're not sure. So you're like me, a little greedy at first and looking everywhere. But if you do know what you're after, filtering is a real help. Uh, because searching can be time consuming and, and take a number of search sessions to to find what you need, uh, consider keeping track of where and how you, you searched. Um, 
This can limit backtracking and retrying searches that that weren't useful. So maybe when searching for something like curriculum, making note, ah, there was too much that came up, it was too broad, I need to figure out something mm -hmm. later to, to search something different. And then uh, finally, consult with a librarian like me. Uh, we have expertise in searching and have developed expertise in searching for OER materials as well. And uh, we're here to help. You don't have to do uh, it all on your own. Um, there's lots of resources on campus to help you with that. And we will also be talking about that later too. So when you're ready to start searching, um, there are many places to search. There's lots of OER directories that have been created by tons of different organizations and institutions. So it can be overwhelming, um, but again, librarians can help to narrow that down, give you some recommendations of places to search if you want. Um, I do also like to mention that while it's possible you, for you to find like the absolute perfect OER for your needs, it's more likely that you may have to adapt something to work or even create your own materials if you find there really isn't anything on your specific topic. Um, because this is a growing area, we can't guarantee the kinds of materials you need are out there waiting for you to use, but it's still worth searching because you may find something that you hadn't expected along the way. There's a lot of serendipity to, to searching. That's for sure. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I mentioned there are many places to search and I have a few links here that I tend to recommend searching first. And these links are actually clickable on your screen on the slides. Um, eCampus Ontario Open Library and BC Open Collection from BC Campus are probably the most recognized in Canada and are great places to start. They will also uh, tend to have more Canadian content in them uh, than some other platforms that might be more US or internationally focused. Um, OER Commons is quite well known internationally and then uh, Mason OER MetaFinder attempts to search a number of different OER directories at once so it can kind of consolidate searches together. Uh, if you'd like to do some quick searching while I show you some examples, I'm going to put some links in the chat for you. Uh, you're more than welcome to check them out. Uh, try a few searches in there. Uh, um, so yeah, let's look at what's what's in one of these. Um, so this example is from eCampus Ontario's Open Library. This is an OER textbook. Uh, notice it's also a Canadian edition, which is nice. Um, Canadian editions, like I said before, uh, will show up a lot here and in the BC Campus directory as well. Uh, there will typically be information about the author, how many times it's been downloaded, and uh, lower down on the page there is a section for reviews. Not all OER have reviews, but if you find some, I do recommend reading them to get a sense of uh, what others th think about the material and add that into your consideration. Depending on the material uh, that you're looking at, there may be a few different download and share buttons and options based on like different file types, for example. These are typically meant to increase shareability and accessibility of the material to accommodate like different devices and uh, different softwares, things like that. So inside this textbook, they've included learning objectives for each section and chapter noted in, the, in this green colored or, or shaded box here. And then they also included a number of uh, different exercises, not uh, not all the OER textbooks will look this way, but uh, I wanted to highlight some of the features of this one to show you that there aren't necessarily just uh, text and can include some supplementary material to help with uh, the design and organization of your course too. So some may have uh, assignment examples or even lesson plans added to them. And here's another example, but this time it's an interactive activity. Uh, this is an escape room activity that's meant to gamify the memorization of safety procedures in a clinical setting. And here's what the inside of one of the components of this um, activity look like. It's uh, essentially a flip card. So it'll have an image of PPE on one side and then a number on the back. And uh, what they need to do is identify the correct order to put on their PPE. 
and a secret code will be revealed to unlock the next section of the escape room. So this is something that could potentially be added as a study aid for students without having to make too many changes to, to course content. Uh, so when I'm helping instructors locate OER, I get a lot of questions about quality, which are important questions to be asking. And there isn't a one step solution to identifying the quality of an OER, but there are a number of steps you can take to assist in your decision of uh, adopting an OER or not. Your subject expertise, of course, will be called upon a lot as you're reviewing the OER you're considering. You'll be the best judge of uh, like the accuracy of the content and its relevance to, to your course or to a specific learning objective. Um, there are some reviews available and uh, peer review of OER is a growing area, but it's not a universal practice yet. Some institutions are starting up uh, OER peer review programs for the OER that they publish, so be on the lookout for any that have been peer reviewed. Most directories do a good job of indicating uh, if it has been peer reviewed. There may be an icon or a little note or something saying that it was peer reviewed. You'll also want to consider the accessibility of of the OER you're considering. Not all are created with accessibility in mind, but uh, many are adopting best practices and some even indicate if they have been created using a specific set of accessibility requirements or standards. And lastly, you'll need to consider the licensing of the material. Uh, what are you permitted to do and does that hinder how you want to use the material? So this is the second time that I've mentioned licenses, so uh, let's dig into that a little bit more. So earlier on, we talked about the difference between free versus open materials, and I had mentioned copyright at that point. Uh, copyright applies to all expressions of an idea or a fact. This presentation, for example, is protected under copyright, uh, and copyright is like the the baseline that all materials have and protects against uh, redistribution and modification uh, without asking for permission first. Open licenses are a way to indicate in advance that certain activities or uses are allowed without having to ask permission to, to do those activities. So a license doesn't replace copyright, but allows for additional uses above what copyright would normally allow. And Creative Commons licenses are one of the most widely known and used licenses uh, for OER. And again, that like gray box there with the icons in it is what an image of a Creative Commons license would look like. So Creative Commons licenses can be made up of four different conditions that can be used like in a bunch of different combinations. And these licenses indicate that what you must do in order to uh, reuse and share. So for example, by or by, the little icon with the person in it means that you must give credit when you reuse the material. Essay or share alike means you have to share under the same license terms. Uh, so it would also have to be an open material. Uh, and C stands for non-commercial. So you cannot use it for commercial purposes. And then ND or no derivatives means exactly that, no derivatives or adaptations. And a little side note on ND, materials that use this license are technically not OER, since this goes against like the ethos of, of openness, where we want people to be able to use those five Rs, which include revising and, and remixing. And then an additional license that Creative Commons has is CCO or CC0, which means the work has been put directly into the public domain. So CC0 provides the most permissions for use, while something like a CC by NC and D would be like the most restrictive, allowing the least amount of those permissions. And while we're thinking about all the ways uh, that information can be open and shared, it's also important to recognize that some information is not meant to be open or only in certain contexts. And some information also uh, doesn't fit within the strict confines of copyright. Uh, traditional knowledge labels are a way to address some of these gaps in our information systems, especially towards uh, traditional knowledge. 
So TK labels consist of three categories, provenance, protocol, and permission. There are a number of unique labels within each of these categories, so I've just highlighted a few here as examples. So for example, TK attribution is similar to CC BY in that recognition of the correct uh, sources and owners of that information needs to be included. So this label is meant to be customized based on the person or people being represented. And then TK seasonal is used to indicate that information is only accessible or able to be used at certain times of the year or in certain seasons. And TK open to collaboration is used to indicate that the community who cares for or owns this information is open to research collaboration. So I hope these examples show that these labels can be very specific. So it's important to refer back if um, you're ever unsure of a label's meaning. And I'll just pop the traditional knowledge labels uh, site in the chat if you're interested in exploring that further. OK, now we're going to do a little shift. Uh, and um, I feel like I am the perfect person or the perfect example of a person that the Rangers program is intended to address. I say that because I'm curious, I'm willing, I'm willing to learn, but I'm also, I don't know very much. I would, I know a little more, but not a lot. And I'm a little intimidated, overwhelmed when I listen to Kim and she's telling me all this information. I do my training. I think, oh, wow, there's so much to know. So I'm going to be uh, doing or taking in the advice of starting small and growing. So in the next slide, you'll see me in the bottom left. It's like those you are here on the mall maps. I am here. I'm just starting out. So the next couple of slides are going to give you a little flavor of my OER journey so far. I think everyone, when they first start looking at OERs, uh, have to think a little bit about how much time and energy can you devote to this project, to this process. And like everybody, I'm pressed for time and um, I don't maybe have enough expertise to do something big, but um, I'm hoping that as I engage and build my um, understanding, I will become more uh, effective. But I'm looking at the bottom end right now. Uh, so when I think about what are my needs, uh, because I want a purpose for my search, I'm thinking about a course I'm teaching right now, which is on uh, curriculum development for adult educators. And uh, that course has been running a little while. It's a core course, and so I get lots and lots of students moving through. It's dependent on an ebook that's accessible, but it's written uh, by a European a woman in uh, Ireland. It was written in 2014. So it doesn't have any Canadian. It's all the examples are global um, and mostly European. And at 2014, it's starting to maybe get a little dated. It has nothing about uh, chat GPT, for example. So I started to get a little antsy about it and thinking I needed to do some gap filling and maybe uh, some updating in my search for a resource. And so that was my purpose as I launched myself into the OER journey. I was very excited. I remember um, I mentioned already that I had that little too big, too small, where am I going kind of experience in my search. But I was very excited to find this document uh, on lifelong learning put out by eCampus Ontario. So it met the Canadian uh, focus. It's relatively current, 2021. It was definitely on topic, talking about adult learning and the landscape of education generally, but particularly learning beyond secondary school and on into decades of adult education. It was only eight pages, uh, so that's kind of a nice little size to insert into a session. 
uh, packed with information, packaged in a very uh, engaging, eye appeal sort of way. So I thought, oh, perfect. But I was a little concerned about the ND designation, uh, no derivatives. And so that made me wonder, well, what can I actually do with this? Uh, and so Kim, I went to my librarian, as Kim advises us to do, and Kim um, told me that yes, you could use this, and yes, you could do things like highlighting or adding a text box or doing something like that, as long as you kept it within the space, the bright space, and the course um, sort of framework. Did you want to add something to that there, Kim? Uh, yeah, so this is a good example of how that no derivatives license or piece of the license can kind of make you feel like a little restricted in what you want to do. So if uh, if Joanne, you wanted to make students activity and, and work around like annotating and adding stuff mm -hmm. or making changes to this material, you wouldn't be able to do that openly because of this this particular license, but there are ways that you can still use these materials, um, like especially if you're leaning on fair dealing, for example, to to use it within within your class setting. So if we flip to the next slide. This is OK, so this is just a little example of what I'm thinking for now. So what I thought was that my students uh, participate in discussion forums. So I have about five, four or five people in a cluster. So I thought those each student could annotate their own sort of naked version, share their annotations with each other. And by doing that, synthesize what did they consider the most important pieces of information in that document that applied to their situation as curriculum developers for adults. So they would have possibly have in their classes, uh, their own classes, not my classes, their classes, uh, students who would just be maybe uh, out of uh, early stage of university or college, becoming a dental hygienist or whatever it is, uh, right on up to um, recreational courses with older, much older uh, adults. So that's my way of using an OER in a forum. Now, I was also happy to find this resource, um, much more extensive, not an eight pager, it's a full blown, I'm not even sure if I can call it a textbook. It's so, so multi-layered and so rich. Um, I was happy to see that it had been developed collaboratively with uh, educators across many Ontario uh, colleges and universities, uh, and it had been uh, downloaded and adopted. So that gave me the uh, kind of confidence that probably the quality was was pretty good and worth my time to investigate further. And I was also happy to look at the licensing and think, OK, there's going to be lots of flexibility and perhaps potential use here. So in it, I went. Next slide, please. Thank you. So earlier in my story, I said how important it was to kind of identify a purpose for your search, gap filling or updating or something like that. But here's an example of a find that sort of indicated a, a need that I didn't actually articulate or know that I had a need. Um, so let me just backtrack a little bit. In my curriculum design course, there's an element of self-assessment. And I find that often students require or want uh, more structure and a lot of prompting and support in uh, writing their self-assessments. So in that hidden curriculum document, it, I was just like, oh, this is fantastic. It had a series of self-assessment quizzes uh, on critical thinking or all kinds of aspects of learning that the responses to those quizzes took the learner to a series of support documents and activities that would support the development of those skills. Now that's a something I would take me a million years to develop myself and here it was. So it met my 
desire, I guess, to find something that I could use as is and um, uh, insert into my course in some way that uh, was flexible. So you can see, I, I, you can see why I'd be excited. There is so much more in there. Uh, so I guess my point just is that when you're doing your OER search, it's like any treasure hunt. You can dig a lot of holes and not find that treasure chest. And something to think about is that if you're not finding what you're looking for, that might be a cue to develop it yourself. Maybe there's a need. If you have that need, there probably are other people. And maybe it's a little kind of uh, incentive for you to think about developing your own OER. But long story short, you can dig and dig and maybe not come up with the treasure right away. But when you hit pay dirt, it could be fantastic. So this kind of brings us close to the end of uh, our presentation. But before we kind of move into the last little section, we'd like to pause for a minute and sort of ask you, uh, how do you see yourself using an OER or do you? Uh, what benefits of OERs do you see as most uh, exciting or applicable to your, your own situation? And if you are, again, already using an OER, maybe this is another opportunity for you to share with us something that um, you found useful or it's a strategy that uh, has turned out to be very effective for you. While people are thinking of something to to respond in the chat. Oh, sorry, you'd like to speak. Yes, please, Alana. Hi, everybody. Sorry, I joined in late. I was actually at an editorial meeting uh, for Frontiers Journal, so I actually missed everything. But you know, given your question, I just have to say that there are so many uh, wonderful opportunities to connect with other scholars that are doing like-minded work, like yourself. Mm -hmm. So doing searches under a topic of importance to you um, um, that you're teaching about or researching on, it's wonderful. There's, I just have to say that I, I'm in all praise of these opportunities and that they're um, open and free, accessible to students is another big, huge bonus. So I'm a real um, advocate for this. Yeah, me too. Oh, that's so nice to hear. Yeah, we got some stuff coming in the chat. Readings, lesson ideas, case examples. Ooh, a question. Do the textbooks typically come with instructors, resources, PowerPoints, discussion, question? That really depends on the author of the OER and whether they've decided to include those or not. Some of them, they have so many supplementary, supplementary materials, but then others will just have the immediate text. And I have seen some people that it's clear they've kind of created supplementary materials for maybe a text, but they've like published them in uh, those directories separately. So they're not as linked to the material. So it really, it really depends on how the creators of it have developed that over time and how they've shared them in a directory. But there, there are some exist. And like we said in the beginning, there might be not like the perfect thing, but you may find like little pieces that you can combine together to make the perfect thing for, for your class. Again, I just want to come back to that idea that if you don't find the perfect thing and in, in the real world, what is perfect, you might find components that your students, like you and your students can you develop yourself to become the perfect thing. Oh, and I do recognize we're talking about like, hey, the perfect thing might not exist. Um, and then just, just asking, just saying, well, you could create something yourself. We know that that will take a lot of time. <laughs> An effort to do so that is something that you have to consider when you're when you're thinking about whether you're going to use OER or not because there is 
some time at least and some effort involved in switching over materials or adding these to, to your course. That might be a good uh, to say. Yeah. Yeah. So while we're kind of on that topic, and if others are still thinking of stuff they want to add in chat, please continue to do that. We'll look back at the chat. Um, so let's talk about supports that are available to you. So again, we recognize that considering adopting or even adapting or creating is going to require certain levels of time and effort. So um, we did want to uh, share some of the supports that are available both at Brock and by the province to uh, help with this work. So CPI and the library are two places on campus where you can get assistance. So CPI specializes in OER editing and creation, and they have uh, expertise in OER publishing platforms and tools that can help you to get started. And they are also, of course, an excellent resource uh, to help you connect an OER to your curriculum and your learning outcomes and make sure it aligns with the goals of your, of your course or your program. Uh, the library, on the other hand, has expertise in finding OER and sharing your OER that you create in those directories that I was talking about earlier and making sure they are findable by others. And we also have uh, copyright licensing and, and fair dealing knowledge to help you navigate like what permissions and rights you have to reuse and, and share certain materials. Um, and beyond support services, you may want to try and make use of some financial supports that are available through both Brock and eCampus Ontario. Uh, so Brock's OER adoption grant provides funds for uh, either individuals or teams in the adoption of OER. It's open to all Brock faculty, and the only condition is you must be adopting an OER on an ongoing basis for, for a course or a program. And uh, they've just updated a new deadline for the OER adoption grant. So the next deadline is January 31st. So if you're thinking about doing it and maybe having some financial support is kind of like the push you need to do it, please do uh, apply. Uh, and then eCampus Ontario has a few different grants available, one for uh, adopting an OER, uh, one for peer reviewing an OER, and one for uh, updating OER based off of reviews. So if you've created one in the past and uh, you've gotten comments on it, then uh, you might be able to get some money for updating it. Uh, so there are ways to get involved in this work beyond just creating an OER and still get some funding for your time. So like the peer review one, for example, if you're not sure you want to create something, but you want to contribute, that might be a really great way to help contribute to um, assisting with the creation of and review of OER. Oh, and thanks, I, Leah, for the link. I was just added a link here that will support that. Yeah. Awesome. Mm -hmm. So uh, Kim and I have just given you a kind of surface, not quite surface, but um, an overview of OERs. Uh, we have, as the Rangers, have gone through a little training program, and the link to the training is there on the screen now, and it will give you a lot more uh, detail and some really fabulous um, examples and uh, reminding you that we're not just talking about little documents here. We can You can go big and, uh, no, big and small. <laughs> small and big, I guess, is really what I'm after. Uh, and then uh, just going back to what Kim said about Brock and the library and the CPI uh, as um, very rich and helpful places to go for help. So I'm going to uh, end the recording now. And if there's any questions, you can raise your hand and speak through your mic or you can put them into chat and we'll be happy to answer everything we can. Someone's just said thank you to us.